We have two wonderful speakers tonight. I'm sure you're going to enjoy their presentations. <clears throat> they have made this presentation several places across the country and been very, very warmly received for the work that they've been doing over the past nine years. Both are professors at Boston University, and my colleague and friend, Ann Donahue, is an associate professor who is also an associate dean. Um, she works on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion at the College of Communication. And for those of you interested in the media, she's the faculty advisor to the radio station that the students run. She does a great job with that. WTBU. <coughs> Yes, <laughs> and um, she is also directing the Global Health Storytelling in the G College of Communication. Um, but before she came to BU as a professor of journalists, she had a very, very impressive career and background in journalism. Absolutely amazing. She's worked for the Christian Science Monitor. She's also been a contributor to NPR the BBC, WGBH, WBUR, and many other public radio programs. And she's won a very, very prestigious award in the field. It was a DuPont Columbia Award for the DNI files, which she published on NPR. And in addition to that, we <laughs> have many conversations because both of us have been Fulbright scholars. I was in Ireland and you were in China. So she had a Fulbright over in China and your family joined you over there and had a wonderful experience. She's also interested in other countries, so those students who are here tonight who are international might be very interested to know. She's also interested in Egypt, she's interested in Japan, Indonesia, and she's done a lot of work throughout the United States and in many, many areas. And she has a particular interest on stories that deal with issues like women and AIDS, and population and women's reproductive health, and also the treatment of women and girls in the developing world. So her background, her research interests are all well suited to work here with her colleague from <laughs> from the Department of Global Health over in the medical campus. We worked on the Charles River campus and she works on the medical campus. Um, she is a clinical associate professor and she is the editor of Public Health Post. And she leads a whole program over there at the medical school in public health writing. And she also is directing the certificates they now have in global health and program management in the graduate program at the School of Public Health. She teaches courses in global mental health, global health storytelling, and public health writing. She founded the program along with uh, Professor Donahue that we're going to hear about tonight which is Global Health Storytelling. It's a wonderful collaboration between the medical school, the School of Public Health, the College of Communication, and the Pulitzer Center. I'm sure you've all heard of Pulitzer Prizes. Um, <clears throat> they work with them. And what they look at in the research that they do is the similarities and tensions between global health research, which is very, very important in our health environment today worldwide, and also how journalists report the news, and sometimes there are tensions between the folks who are studying and, you know, engaged in public health and those who are reporting in the news about public health. So I anticipate we're going to have a great presentation tonight. Thank you both for coming. Thank you. So um, I guess we'll start at the beginning. Jen and I came to this from very different places. Um, I think if you think about a crisis, uh, a health crisis, an earthquake, we started really around the Haiti earthquake was one of our first projects. The first people to show up are public health workers and journalists. And sometimes they get along, 
but sometimes they don't. And we're trying to figure out ways that we can build that bridge so that when a crisis happens, we can work more collaboratively rather than against each other's wishes and needs. So that's how the program first kind of gelled together. And I had done a lot of public health reporting, and Jen had done a lot of public health writing. In fact, she's got a PhD in English literature, so she's really like triply smart. Um, triply I'm just smart. A, a lowly master's degree. Um, so we got together and um, sort of figured out where do we collide, and where do we collaborate, and how do we teach students who are going to become aid workers or journalists uh, going out into the field to work together in a way that helps, ultimately helps the public health. And my, my line for us is that we try to put the public in public health. You know, we try to get the public engaged in public health issues by communicating the stories much better than the scientists do, who are very wonky and have lots of data and lots of numbers and lots of studies, but they can't translate that to an average person out there who's trying to take care of themselves. So that's where we start. So I'm just going to add one little piece to this, and this is since so many of you are students, the, the power of students. So we're together because of students. Um, we met because I had a student um, named Kate in the School of Public Health. She was doing her MPH, and she wanted to do a sort of non-traditional final project. And we usually do these kind of very sciencey thesis <coughs> type things. And she wanted to do a video or a, a photojournalism essay. And I said, that's a great idea. I have no idea how to do that. Go find somebody. And she found Anne. And um, Anne was incredibly helpful to her and then came over and met with us. And we started talking about, well, we have a lot of shared interests. What, what can we do together? And that's when we started kind of pushing our interested students toward one another's classes. Then another Kate came along. And um, she's actually the person who connected us with the Pulitzer Center. So she was another School of Public Health student, went and took Anne's audio journalism class, got Anne to go to a talk with um, John Sawyer from the Pulitzer Center, and 10 years the later, here we are. Story. So, yeah. so if it weren't for students, we wouldn't be here. So yes. you, guys, you guys drive the train, so. Yeah. OK, so what is global public health? Yeah. Yeah, so I will, um, we're going to go back and forth a little bit. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we'll talk about sort of what, what our different fields are. Um, so what is global health? What's journalism? What's the intersection between the two? What are the ways in which we, we get along? We have a lot of shared interests. What are the ways in which we, we clash? And um, then what we've been doing over the last several years, which includes um, this program on global health storytelling, which we'll tell you about with the Pulitzer Center plus a class that we teach um, by the same name. So it, I'm going to start by, um, I'm going to say, does somebody want to define public health for me to just take a stab at it? How would you define public health? So, like Anne said, I did my, P my PhD in English literature um, and then an MPH much, much later on. I had no, I never heard of public health until I was probably in my 30s. So, don't be embarrassed if you can't define it, but um, yeah. I'm not going to define it as much as a current situation, say, triple E here in Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Public health. Okay. Yeah. So it's, um, it's about prevention and about understanding how a disease moves through a population and then, you know, sort of screening and how, how we sort of teach the public how to protect themselves plus we do things like go out and kill mosquitoes and, you know, so it, it basically public health is, is kind of everything and then when you start talking about um, about global health, then you're talking about everything all around the world. And so one of the things we talk about a lot in public health are the social determinants of health. And that's basically the everything you, it's the air you breathe, it's the house you live in, it's the clothes you wear, it's the food you eat, it's the... Um, access sort of, to medical care. <laughs> access to medical care, the... Um, the, the income level of your parents, the education of your parents, the kind of schools that you go to, all of those things influence your physical and mental health. 
Um, and so I'm just going to give you some official and not so official, official definitions. So the WHO, um, World Health Organization, defines, this is the wonky definition, um, public health as all organized measures, whether public or private, to prevent disease, promote health, and prolong life among the population as a whole. And that as a whole is the important part. Um, it's very much about populations. So it's activities aimed to provide conditions in which people can be healthy and focus on entire populations, not individual patients or diseases. Public health is concerned with the whole system. So that, you know, it's a useful definition. It, it, it covers a lot. Then I had um, a colleague, um, Dr. Bill Bicknell at, the, at Boston University. He started the Department of Global Health. He, uh, he died in 2012, but I still have this quote hanging up over my desk. He um, used to love to shock people by saying that public health is the art and science of deciding who will die when and in what degree of misery. Um, and that really is very much um, the same definition. It's about you sort of making, making decisions based on the resources that you have available about who will get the most benefit from where you put those resources. Um, another nicer way of saying what he said is it's the art and science of deciding who lives a longer, less miserable, and happier life. So um, is this familiar to anybody? This is also something that I didn't know about until I went and did an MPH. So, but I find this to be incredibly useful. This is, um, this is a socio-ecological model. Um, so for those of you who are doing um, sociology, it's something that you'll probably come across or maybe have come across at some point. So basically, this is just a way of talking about those determinants of health that I was just mentioning. And so, you know, if you imagine that right here in the center, you've got, you've got a person and so you've got the individual, their situation, their behavior, and at the core there, you've got their biology. So that's the person. And that person is surrounded by the people they know, the communities and institutions that they are a part of, like LaSalle College, like being part of the town of Newton or the city of Newton. Um, there's the legal and the policy environment. So what is the, uh, what is the, the situation in the, the city and the country where you live, what are the laws that, that, that affect your life, that create your life and the conditions of your life? All sorts of overarching factors, including things like roads, electricity, so infrastructure, economics, history, colonialism, um, and the environment. So, so what might be a law that affects your health? Yeah. Medicare benefits. Okay. Yeah, that's one. Yeah. If you're if you're a woman of childbearing age, what might be a law that affects your health? Any, any like um, abortion laws? Right. So mm -hmm. your your health is dependent upon some people in Washington to decide what you can do with your body. Um, so there's a legal piece to this. And then what? Where does it, does it matter that you live in Newton versus living in some other part of Massachusetts or some other part of the world? What are things that might be better or worse in Newton than you might find someplace else? Uh, I think, personally, um, income levels mm -hmm. definitely determine because you might have easier access to public health care facilities, mm -hmm. whereas in another country or in another community, that not, might not be publicly funded in the way that it would be here. So you get different, um, different degrees of service um, depending on where you live, I think. And what about the environment? Even even within Newton, if you live in a certain neighborhood of Newton or a certain neighborhood of Boston, some places you're going to suck up more smog because your house is next to the interstate, and some places you're going to be lots of trees, and it's going to be a little bit healthier. So where you live, even within the Boston area, is going to determine who's you know going to be healthier. Mm -hmm. So those are just everything about your life affects your health. Yeah, so just remember remember the socio-ecological model because it comes in really handy, especially when you're, you're trying to think through a really difficult problem, like, um, give me a really difficult problem. My life. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
people we could do that. <laughs> Let's talk about it. a health problem. A health problem. Well. A, 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 Let's talk about eviction. Okay. You know, eviction we and are. housing, um, housing inequality, and housing insecurity in the U.S. And you kind of want to understand how it affects people in all these different ways and how you might intervene in it. But it's just a big mess. You just think, oh, I can't think about that. It's it's too complicated. Something like uh, this socio-ecological model, you can actually start kind of plotting it out and breaking it down and saying, okay, well, what's the individual situation of the people who live in, um, in maybe public housing and then kicked out, get kicked out? Then, you know, sort of what are the, their family relationships like and how is it that maybe they don't have the same sort of family support that um, somebody else might have so they do end up becoming homeless? So it's, it's useful in that way. So quantifying your research. Yep, and breaking it, breaking it down, and sort of trying. The other thing that's where, useful where, about where it, are the places you can intersect with it to help? How? Where do you start? Like, I'm interested because I want to deal with individuals, or because I want to work with families, or because I want to, um, you know, I want to, I want to work for City Hall, and I want to try and make a difference at a policy level. So that's another way of using something like this. But um, this is just one of the things that Anne was alluding to earlier. She wasn't even alluding to it. She was saying it very bluntly. It's like normally do. Is that in public health, we're not very good at talking about what we do. And we use a lot of jargon. Um, and we do annoying things like we, we, um, we, we have different definitions for global health and international health. It's kind of hard to explain what the differences are, but there are some people who are very clear on what the differences are. Um, and then there is um, sort of public health and population health. Those sound like they're the same thing, but for people who are very, you know, sort of highly specialized, they um, they mean different things. So my point being that we have all these specialized words that we use, and we expect everybody else to know what they are and to care. Um, and I think the other thing that I just wanted to point out here is this sort of global local divide. And the way that we approach the Global Health Storytelling Program is that a lot of the programs we do, um, or a lot of the students that we send out and to do fellowships, they go out to low and middle income countries and they report on topics there. But when we're teaching our class in Boston, our students are going out and they're reporting on things in Boston. So that the, it's really a false divide between global and local, that local health is very much global health. You know, what's going on outside my window um, in my office, you know, I, I work at Boston Medical Center where most of um, the addiction and the opioid epidemic is taking place on Mass Ave in front of my office. Um, and that even though I'm in a department of global health, I need to pay, be paying attention to that as much as I'm paying attention to projects that I have in other places in the world. So let's talk about journalism. Okay, so want to hide my definition? Why, yeah. why do we have journalism? What's the point? Yep. To inform the public. Why? Because it's so, so they can do what with that information? You make informed decisions about their health, uh, vote for certain candidates because they understand who they, what they stand for, what policies they stand for. So it's to tell stories that get people engaged in their community and their civic life. It's not, journalism to me is not about what the latest Hollywood person is doing or even what the Patriots are doing. That is journalism in some ways, but the, the real root of it, the First Amendment that our forefathers made in our country is that we need to tell people in a democracy what's going on so they can make an educated decision. So how many of you are U.S. citizens that have registered to vote? Well, if you haven't registered to vote, please do so. It's a very important thing. But read your newspapers or your online news sources and find out what's going on. All right, back to my definition. Okay. Um, I think that was called at the <laughs> All right, so we are in the business of getting and verifying facts. We don't tell lies, we don't tell I guess, we don't tell maybe, we tell what we know to be true at that moment in time. 
stories change, they develop, you get a new set of facts, but we tell what we know, when we know it, as honestly and as truthfully as we can. We, hopefully we don't speculate too much. That said, there's an entire cable network of many, many networks that are doing all speculation all the time about our what's going to happen next in the Trump story. Um, but I think the true but definition of journalism is telling the truth, getting facts and telling them in a good way. Uh, we, we care about accuracy. Make sure your facts are correct. Fairness, wherever possible, you want to listen to both or multiple sides of a story. You don't want to just have one source. You want to have multiple sources and try to consider, if this was a story about me, would I feel like I was being treated fairly? Not, not treated positively, as a PR person might say, but treated fairly. That's important. Uh, balance, context, we'll talk a little bit about that. And to be independent from other influences. You don't want politicians or companies or PR people to tell you what the story is. You want to be independent from any outside influences. So that's what journalism is. My, my loyalty is to you, the reader or the listener or the viewer of my TV show. It is not to my boss. It's not to my employer. It is not to any other cause. It is to the reader. Readers don't pay bills, though. You're right about that. We could have a whole other discussion about that. But there are interesting new models that are coming down the pike, so I think we're, we're still happy. I actually come from public radio primarily, and our business model, everybody used to laugh at. Anybody here listen to public radio, national public radio? Mm -hmm. Call in, give me your $10 donation <laughs> to this public radio station. Everybody used to laugh at us, and now they're all saying, geez, how do we get into that game? Because we need to keep our budget going. So anyway, another story. Um, Advocacy, on the other hand, public relations, is a point of view. I am going to tell you the story that is going to help my company, it's going to help my business, it's going to help my city, it's going to help my politician, and I'm not going to tell you necessarily all the warts and the bad stuff that's going on. I'm just going to try to put the best spin possible on what's going on. So that's the difference between advocacy and journalism, is that my loyalty is to the truth and to the you, the listener, and if I'm a public relations person, hopefully I'm also being truthful, but I also have an obligation to make my employer or my customer uh, be put into the best possible light. So that, I think that's the distinction. Um, you don't necessarily get all points of view in a public relations or an advocacy situation. And um, yeah, loyalty to the cause versus loyalty to the reader. And you can argue with me on that because you're the public relations person, but. I think that's that's really the distinction. Is I, I am not, as a journalist, I'm not advocating. Okay, go ahead. That's what they say. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so then, in reality. Um, all right, so if, you're, if I'm a covering a public health story, let's say Tripoli, e, somebody raised the Tripoli. E. Everybody in Tripoli e aware of Tripoli? E? Okay. So what is it? What is it? Equine, equine, equine encephalitis. encephalitis. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mosquito-borne illness. If I'm assigned to go do that story, is my goal to get more people infected with Tripoli? E? No. Is my goal to get more people aware of Tripoli? E? Yes. Uh, and do I think going to make them aware of precautions they could take to prevent Tripoli? E? Yes. Is that advocacy? Am I saying go put mosquito repellent on as the journalist? Or I'm, I'm saying, researchers say that if you use repellent or if you don't go out after 5 o'clock at night, you probably have a lower chance of getting triple E. So I'm going to say the source told me the factual data is this, but I'm not going to ever say the word should as a journalist. You should go use repellent. You shouldn't go out at 5 o'clock at night. So that's the difference between advocacy and journalism in that case. Jen would argue that just by reporting that there is a problem with a thing that I am advocating that you do something about it. And that's a very fine line. So, yeah. And I'm not saying that that's a problem necessarily, but by um, whenever, and we, we have this, we have a lot of arguments, so basically <laughs> that's the point that's of That's why talk. we get along so well, yeah. we argue so well. Um, is this idea that just be, by the very act of writing that story and publishing it, you're making people aware of the seriousness of it. And by choosing where you put it in the newspaper, where you put it in the, um, in the hour on television or on the radio, how you highlight it, how you feature it, you're, you're, you're advocating on some level, arguably, um, for people to pay attention and to sit up and to do something and to not 
let this just happen. So it, it's a very fine distinction. I would agree that you're advocating for the public safety. We are, we are, I, would, I don't want to use that verb. That's, that's really a little, silly little thing, but I'm saying, I am telling you what the researchers and the fact people tell me to be the truth. I am not me, anchor woman Annie, saying, go use your feet. It's, it's a fine distinction, but it is, in, in less straightforward things, like nobody wants to get AAA, but there are lots of things like that are much more controversial, but I'd be very careful that I say, you know, we want to have abortions legalized, we don't want to have abortions legalized. I mean, that's a public health issue, but I have to be very careful that I'm not in any way letting my audience know where I feel politically on that. So. All right. So, um, there's this intersection where we have things, as we've just talked about, that we care about together. We, we have... Um, we have these these kind of common passions, and I would would you say journalists have passions? Yes. Are you allowed to have passions? <laughs> <laughs> we are passionate, passionate profession. Yes. Um, and I think they were, I I got into journalism because I wanted to make the world a better place, and I thought the way to do that was by informing people so that they can make good decisions that will help them and help their society be a better place. I suspect most people in public health got into public health to do the same thing. Uh, neither of us are going to get rich in this profession. We are not in it for the money or the glory. It is to hopefully be a, you know, create a better world to live in. Uh, how we do it is where we, we sometimes fly. Yeah. So one of the things that's really important for, for, for public health and one of the things that, that we um, can get from journalists and why journalism is important to public health is because, as I was saying before, we, we don't communicate what we do very well at all. So we're very science and policy oriented and we talk in a science and policy language. We're not good at telling stories. We often talk about populations. So we're not talking about a person who you can relate to and say, wow, I see how that person is affected and now I need to sort of make changes or think about my own life in a certain way. We, we don't we should do that more. We don't do it very often. Um, it's and also full of jargon and acronyms. If you look at public health, we, every organization has a you know three or four or five letter abbreviation. It's like alphabet soup trying to read through some public health documents. Very techy, nerdy, and it's very hard for the public to read this public health yeah. literature. So that's where we come in to sort of say we're the translators. We're going to take all this stuff and try to make it make sense. And we're going to highlight a person who is in this situation and we're going to draw you in and tell their story. And by telling their story, we can then back up and talk about kind of the bigger picture and, and pull you in in that way. So it's not something that we're good at. It's something that they're excellent at. And but the Triple E story, are you going to read a journal article by the New England Journal of Medicine to find out what to happen? Or are you going to turn on the local TV to find out what happened? And when you turn that on, do you want somebody to read you a bunch of dry figures and data? Or do you want them to say, boy, Susie, little kid from this neighborhood just got infected and is in the hospital. Let's all care about her and then care about the bigger issue. So I talk about individuals and Jen talks about populations. I talk about emotional impact and they talk about numbers and data. And sometimes those two hit each other. Yeah. Yeah, and there are lots of ways in which the, the, the way we in public health go about doing things that, that where we, we need more um, thinking about, about the individual. You know, we're always, you know, one, one of the things about public health is that public health can be very preachy. Don't do this, don't do that. You know, wear your seatbelts, wear your, it's a lot of finger wagging. And um, that's not always, you know, wear a condom, wear your, I said seatbelts, wear your deep. <laughs> don't, don't vape, please. <laughs> don't vape, don't drink, don't have fun. Um, and so there are many ways that we could use stories better. One of them is when we want, are trying to get people to change their behavior. But another is just in general, going back to what Anne said about telling um, these stories to the public and sharing what we do. So there's all sorts of room for collaboration, but we collide. 
and we've already told you a little bit about that. But yeah, so I, you know, journalists get a bad rap, right? We are the vultures that show up at the grieving family and stick a microphone in their face and say, "How do you feel?" You know, we're all often perceived as sort of being rude, Bigfoot walking in and being clumsy. Um, I, I will totally accept that because I do think there are plenty of journalists that, that do that, especially television journalists where it doesn't matter how many people they step on on the way to getting the microphone in somebody's mouth and um, aren't the most patient and, I mean, I worked in television for a long time so I'm speaking from uh, first-hand knowledge. Um, but you can also say, you know, by being there, I am allowing this person to tell their truth, to tell their story, to share their story, um, giving them an opportunity to explain why they did something, why they feel something. Um, so you can look at it as we're vultures or we're giving people an opportunity, depending on what you want to do. Um, often it's sort of aid coverage when you're, you know, the earthquake happens in Haiti. You know, are we re-traumatizing this family by interviewing them? Are we showing up and saying, tell us again about how miserable and horrible your life is and that you've lost your child or you've lost a loved one? You know, are we making it worse for this family? Or, in some cases, the family wants to say, I want my child re to be remembered. I want the whole world to know who this person was that is now gone. Um, and it really depends on the individual and also how good the journalist is in trying to soothe the families and be polite and kind and respectful of the family that maybe they will share a little bit more that will be helpful to more people. Um, and then we have this ongoing thing about photos, and I'm, we're being videotaped, hello. Uh, what is consent? So this is really in the developing world, you're a photographer, and you come across, in this case we had an unbelievable image of a prostitute sitting on a bed, fully, full frontal nudity, sitting on the bed with the man behind her, and his genitalia is completely hidden, but she's full frontal nudity. And the photographer got permission to take this woman's picture, and we put it up at a conference, not we, but the person, our guest put it up at a conference in front of a giant auditorium of people. And, and Jen's first, my first reaction was, what an extraordinary picture. How did he get access to this? How did he get permission to do this? And her first reaction is, did that woman give consent in wherever she was from, in some developing world country, for an entire audience of Americans sitting in some auditorium in Boston to say, yeah, you can go look at this picture of me naked in my line of work. Um, you know, what is consent? Do people know what they're being shot, videotaped, images taken now, especially with ubiquitous cell phones? Are you really getting consent from those people? It's a very, very difficult um, ethical question about getting permissions and who do you get permissions from. Journalists don't need to get releases from people. They don't get anybody to sign that you're allowed to have your picture taken. If you're in a public place, your picture can be taken. So if you're out, you know, skipping school, and your professor sees you on the news that night because you got into somebody's picture and you claimed you were sick and he, he sees you at this concert happening on the Boston Common. You know, we didn't get that consent. You got into a lot of trouble because we put your picture on the air. So it's a very ethically fraught problem. And another thing we tangle over is language. I come from broadcasting and I want to say the story in the most, the fewest words possible. Be concise. So I want to say somebody is an addict, because I've got 30 seconds to tell this story. In Jen's world, we want to say this person has a substance abuse disorder. So that's 10 more seconds. Substance and use disorder. Substance <laughs> use disorder. See, I've already screwed up. Can't use abuse. Um, so we have lots of, just, have lots you know, of rules. A lots of, sort of politically correct discussions about what language you use, what labels you put on people, and how we do that. And that's an ongoing debate in newsrooms about when we change the language that we used. Um, we have gone from, you know, in the early 60s it was colored people and then it was black people and it was African American people and now it's, you know, sort of talk, ask the person what they want to be called. Gender issues, you know, how do we, how do we genderize people? So, um, lots of issues evolving language in, in newsrooms, usually led by public health people who are saying we need to be more sensitive, we need to be more careful in how we're treating people with these issues. Um, yeah, but just to your point about the acronyms, so <laughs> Anne might use the word addict or um, drug user or abuser. Um, you know, we use, we're supposed to be using people first language, so it's a person with a substance use disorder or a person um, who ingests drugs. Then um, we then start 
using acronyms to to um, say that more concisely, so we start calling people PWIDs. So, I mean, talk about dehumanizing, calling somebody a PWID. And then I was once... And what's PW, person with... Person who injects drugs. Person who injects drugs, yeah, yeah. I didn't even know that one. Yeah. PWID, okay. <laughs> um, and I once heard somebody use the, this is a public health person in Ghana, use the term PWID, and I, it, it took me a few minutes to figure out what he was talking about, PWIDs, but yeah. So, we should have just stuck with the attic, probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing we do want to talk about is sort of fake news and false equivalencies. So, how many people think that climate change is real? Okay. There are lots of people in this universe that, for many years, and large swaths of this population thought it was not real. And early days, when we first were beginning to report on climate change, and the in my mind, it was sort of the early 90s when it started taking hold. Um, we would have the climate scientists who say, this is really serious bad news, and then you'd have sort of climate deniers who are saying, this is all a hoax, this isn't real. And as journalists, you're trying to balance the story, so you're putting both people in the story as if they both have equal merit. But when science determines year after year after year after year after year, that this is being documented, scientifically proven, do we still need to give voice to this other denier? Vaccines. How many people here think we should get vaccinated? Okay. There's plenty of people who think there's problems with vaccines, that they're concerned about a one false scientific report that linked vaccines to autism way back 10, 15 years ago has created an entire population of people who really think that vaccines are dangerous and potentially going to harm their children and are heartfelt. Um, so, you know, do we talk to the, the people that are opposed to vaccines and give them as much weight as the scientists who can show you years and years and years of science that this is a serious problem if you don't get vaccinated? You know, these are debates that we have in newsrooms all the time. It's how much weight do you put on one source versus another source? Um, so we have a student story that we're going to play. Um, and this was about the bathroom initiative on the ballot. Was it last fall? It was last fall. It was question three. Yeah. And it was about having gender neutral bathrooms in Massachusetts. Or was it just Boston? It was all of Massachusetts. It's all in Massachusetts, and it was about more than that. It was about public services. So being able to, if you are um, transgender, being able to, the, the most obvious thing that people often talk about is use the bathroom that that matches your gender identity rather than your biological gender. But it also um, covered all sorts of other things having to do with where you can be in a public public space and feel, feel protected. But it often came down to talking about bathrooms. Um, so we'll just play it and then we can discuss. This November, Massachusetts voters aren't just electing public officials. They're determining the rights of people who identify as transgender. In 2016, Senate Bill 2407 was passed, prohibiting the discrimination of transgender people in public spaces. Two years later, Bay Staters will vote to uphold or repeal the legislation. The referendum is most commonly referred to as Question 3, and experts and members of Boston's LGBT community are concerned about its effect on trans health. This is already affecting the well-being of trans people just by putting this up for a popular debate and popular vote. We are seeing a lot of issues of people contacting us with experiencing discrimination and anxiety and all sorts of real health implications because our identities are up for debate on the front page of the newspaper. That's Mason Dunn, the executive director of the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition, as well as co-chair of the Yes on 3 campaign. He's an activist, a lawyer, and an educator at the University of New Hampshire at Manchester, where he specializes in LGBT images and perspectives. He shares his experience with me during lunchtime outside of his office, downtown Boston. I came out as trans when I was about 19 years old, but I didn't medically transition until I was about 25. And, you know, I've, I've, seen, I've seen a lot. I, I've seen very hateful incidents. I have experienced harassment and assaults on the basis of my gender identity. I have been removed from public spaces by security because of my gender identity. And I've also seen so much growth 
and change in the world. Mason says legislation like Bill 2407 not only give trans people protections, it sends a message. Laws like this tell the community, tell this small and often discriminated against community that you are valuable. You are a member of this community and you deserve the same rights as anybody else in accessing public spaces. And I, I think that that sends a very clear and hopeful message to particularly trans folks who maybe aren't out yet to know that this state has their back should they face discrimination or harassment and it makes it safer to come out and to live authentically. Of course, trans people aren't the only ones who come out in Massachusetts LGBT community. My name is Ryan Thurston. I am identified non-binary. I lived in Massachusetts pretty much my whole life, 40 years old. So I've been identifying as a man for 40 years and I still present as a man, but recently, very recently discovered that I don't really feel male and I've never really felt male. So that's been, that's been my, my, my journey so far. I met Ryan outside of Boston University's College of Communication, where they work as a registrar and special advisor to discuss their experience coming out in New England. I do think that there's there are higher levels of, of tolerance and acceptance here. That's what I've always found in my research of sort of, of you know trying to learn more about myself. I came across amazing communities of LGBTQ people, which is one of the most welcoming communities. I've ever found it, it seems like here in Massachusetts that it's it's such a strong community that gave me confidence in coming out. Mason Dunn says that with question three on the horizon, that LGBT community, specifically as trans community members, are under fire. Our identities are being discussed in social media and we are being expo exposed to all of these attitudes and, and anti-trans sentiment and bias uh, all over the place. I can only imagine what that will do and how that will increase should the no side on question three win. Can we speak a little bit more to you know, some of these implications, We're talking mental health? Or... The trans community faces uh, minority stress, being a, a small community, a community where there's a lot of miscommunication and misinterpretation of who we are, and so that results in higher rates of depression, anxiety, as well as suicide ideation amongst trans individuals, and particularly at risk are trans youth. <coughs> And in the, the current atmosphere, it's getting worse. For WTVU, I'm Jeff Fine. Okay. So was that piece journalism or advocacy? Advocacy. Say it again? Advocacy. Why did you say that? They only showed one side of the problem. What's the, what's the other side of the problem? Well, the opinion is that um, that there is not really all that the discussion should be happening because it was saying that he felt um, I don't want to say pressure, but like he felt like his identity was being attacked or something. So yeah, they didn't really mention anything else besides that. Okay, what other others think? Straight up journalism or was there an advocacy point of view? So this, this is a political question about a ballot initiative. So people are gonna vote yes or no on something. So there's clearly some people that did not support this initiative. So were you gonna say something? Mm -hmm. Were you gonna okay. say something? I was just gonna say I was gonna say it was journalism, but I could be wrong. <laughs> um, just because um, it is presenting a story, like a real story that's affecting people's lives, and it's kind of informing the public that you know this is this is gonna be is it is a public issue, but it is also very real. Like the reality of talking about this is affecting people, so I can see how it's a story because um, you're informing the public that this is real and this is happening and it has an effect. So I can see the more journalistic, journalistic. I don't know if that's no, word. Yeah. Oh, the journalistic side too. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Well, we had a big, big debate in class about this because. As much as I might agree with everything that Jeff, the reporter, said, 
this, this is a political question that people are going to go to a ballot or vote yes or no. And that everything in that piece was giving me all the reasons why I should support this transgender community and this bill that would help them out. But there were people, and they might not be me, but there were people in the state of Massachusetts that were not going to support this. And I felt to be balanced, we needed to hear from that other point of view. And we had a long debate in class about whether this is a false equivalency, because one of the arguments of the people that were opposed to this were saying things like, if you make these transgender bathrooms available, people are going to get molested and sexually assaulted in bathrooms. You know, that didn't hold a lot of scientific evidence because there was no evidence gathered to make that point, first of all. And what are the odds that a man could walk into any woman's room that he wanted to, or a woman could walk into any men's room that she wanted to, and assault somebody? It didn't matter if you were trans or not trans. You know, bathrooms would have labels on the door, but it doesn't mean anybody couldn't walk in. So it was a long debate, and ultimately it didn't go into the piece, and I thought it should have been, but I, I lost that. I part. think he changed it. Did he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, we, we did have this debate, and I was on the other side of it which was a, that it's a false equivalency and why would we give airtime to um, a position that is so um, sort of devoted to restricting the rights of other people, that this is about human rights and that we wouldn't be um, sort of get, airing the views of, of of others who sort of see certain segments of this of, of society as being less than human. So and in that vein, yeah. you wouldn't have covered Charlottesville, the neo-Nazis marching in Charlottesville, because you don't agree with them. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's where journalism comes down. Yeah. I have to give voice and I have to give yeah. opportunity to people I don't agree with every day. You know, I, I have my own political beliefs, I have my own moral code, and it's not the same as everybody else's on the planet. But my job is to reflect the views of both sides, or multiple sides. There may be three or four or five points of view. Um, but it's a, it's a constant balancing act, because how much weight do you give to that really person that's out on the fringes of society, and give them equal weight to sort of this preponderance of evidence over here? But you know you have to cover things like Charlottesville. You have to cover the whole alt-right movement that is moving and growing in this country. I don't agree with them personally, but if we don't listen to them and figure out who they are and why they are, then how do we act to counterbalance that? So. And I think I, I ultimately came around to understanding that, especially once and now really listening to it and really listening to it. It's been a long time since. Um, since we had this debate, I, I was realizing just now that he doesn't ever really say what the two sides are. So, um, I'm right. you're right. <laughs> right. I this, I um, and this that's round. how he fixed it. So he basically didn't, I think my argument was why would you, you know, sort of give as much air time to sort of somebody else um, who has this, this this opinion that's going to completely undermine the humanity of this person who's speaking. And... That's my job, undermine humanity of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What I realized, well, though, is that you can still give both sides and not undermine the, undermine the humanity of anybody. Everybody. I feel like um, giving that counterpart, even if it's, it is the un unpopular opinion, might fuel the might give more perspective on why this position is ethically right because people that hear like I feel like essentially like in this argument these people just feel uncomfortable with it and that's what they're that's their argument so how I'm seeing it is like giving that perception of it could make people see like wow the counter argument doesn't make sense yeah and then give more shed more light on why this is the right does that make sense? Yeah, the research shows, though, that most people watch news and get validated, whether mm -hmm. they're for Trump or against Trump. They're going to see what they want to see, they're going to hear what they want to hear, and it's going to validate them. There's very few people in the middle. And in fact, your generation, your age group, are the most fluid in terms of 
actually listening and absorbing and figuring out where they stand because they don't come with an already set mindset, right? It's sort of like, maybe I should listen to this person and that person and come up with my own moral compass and my own opinions. But um, most people, as we age, we sort of say, I'm here, I'm stuck here, and I'm not moving. And mm -hmm. so it's very hard to change people's minds. Mm -hmm. Did you have a comment back there? Did you have a hand up? Oh, sorry. Okay. All right, how are we doing? Time. Um, we can skip this. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, we'll tell you a little bit about the, um, our program on global health storytelling, and then we'll tell you a little bit about our class, and we'll play you one more story and tell you the story of this student, and then we can um, have time for discussion. So um, one of the things that we do in our collaboration, so once again, it's a collaboration between the School of Public Health, the College of Communication, and the Pulitzer Center is we send students, um, one student from each school each year um, at a minimum, sometimes we have a, a few more, um, off with the Pulitzer Center to do a reporting story. Um, and they've gone all over the world and they have covered um, a lot of just really fascinating topics in you know, all corners of the world. And just by looking at this list, you can get a good sense of the very broad array of what we think about you know, when we're including topics and, and concerns in public health. So our first fellow went and looked at child marriage in Nepal, um, trafficking of brides in Myanmar, cholera in Haiti. Um, these are the older ones. Um, the more recent ones are um, for Zika and the impact of Zika on sexual and reproductive health in El Salvador, suicide in Guyana, um, women living with mental illness in Ethiopia, organ transplants One in Venezuela. One of the most powerful ones we did, the a student who happened whose name yeah. happens to be the same as mine, but uh, female genital cutting in Mali. And she actually, if, if you talk, want to talk about a controversial issue, right, this is something that is extremely controversial because it's culturally accepted norm in some places in the world and then pretty horrifying to a lot of other people in the West. Um, she actually, the student interviewed a woman who did the actual cutting and had pictures of the blade that was used to actually cut these women and put this cutter into this incredibly favorable light. She really talked about the cultural norms and the generations of people and how it was done to her. And, she, and it was like, you can understand sort of the mindset of this person that I thought I would have nothing in common with, but there was something there that I could, I could see her humanity a little bit. Um, in this story, it was very, very powerful, and she ended up getting that published in the Guardian, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so all, all, almost all of these pieces have been published in reasonably well-known uh, news uh, organizations. So, uh, the Pulitzer Center is a wonderful organization that funds journalists covering all these very difficult issues all over the world. So, we've been really thrilled to be part of that uh, process. Um. Yeah, and I guess the interesting, you know, the flip side of what we were just talking about with Jeff's story is that I was saying from the public, my public health perspective, what I didn't want to see in his story is kind of the same thing that Kateri, the student who did this, came up against when she was trying to publish this story because a lot of people in the publishing world and a lot of people from a public health perspective didn't want to hear the story of this woman. They didn't want to actually think about her humanity. But if we thought about it, um, and if we actually tried more actively to work with somebody like her, we would probably um, have a faster and better path to actually stopping female genital cutting, cutting. Because one of the things she talked about was, not only is this my identity and my heritage, but it's also my only means of economic survival. This is what I do. And so I need somebody to you know, help me figure out another another source of income. Um, so we don't need to go into the details of our course, but why don't you start talking about what we do in our course? Um, well, we do a bunch of assignments. We kids go out, I, because I come from an audio TV background, we do audio stories. They go out with microphones on the first day of class and interview people in the field. And from then on, just uh, come up with story ideas that are because we're local, it's going to be local public health stories. Hopefully they have a global angle. We've done immigration stories and migration stories and 
other international addiction, stories, addiction stories, gun and violence. Gun violence. Um, so we try to you know figure out what the local angle is to maybe some of these global health stories. Um, yeah. And then the last assignment is a story for story where a student has to interview somebody, maybe a family member or somebody, um, just a long narrative. Anybody heard of StoryCorps? Check it out. Um, it's storytelling. Um, we're, I will talk to Janice in a, in a booth for 45 minutes. There's a mobile van that goes around the country and collects these stories of Americans in their day-to-day -day lives. And they all are housed at the Library of Congress. So these oral history of the United States is being gathered in these mobile vans. But occasionally, NPR will take one of these longer 45-minute stories and turn it into a little five-minute nugget that airs on, on NPR in the morning. And just recently, I, I, my, for my class, I have kids interview a grandparent or somebody. And oftentimes, I'll hear from a student that the grandparent has passed away and they have this long 45 minute interview and they can hear the grandparent's voice again. So it's a lovely assignment to sort of, if you've got anybody in your life that you care about that you want to hold on to that voice, go home with your iPhone at Thanksgiving or whenever you go home and uh, record them and, and send them to StoryCorps and they'll be in the Library of Congress forever and ever. Did you get it? No, okay. Anyway, that's one of the things we yeah, so this is a graduate level class, and I guess it, it's graduate students, but there are also um, there are also undergrads in it as well. And so the students really have this very steep learning curve because they're also half public health, so they have never even held a tape recorder. Um, they've never necessarily, if they've interviewed somebody, it's been with like a very standardized questionnaire and a lot of yes, no questions. And now they have to go up and stick a microphone in somebody's face and ask them very personal questions about their life and make sure that they're recording it. Has anybody ever done a cold call? Have you ever stuck a microphone in somebody's face? No. Anybody? Yeah. How about a cell phone? Ever record interview How would you feel about doing that? Like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Come on, come on to journalism. <laughs> a lot of people freak out. The first day of class when you give them a microphone and say, go talk to a human being, it's like, what? Especially your generation. I mean, at least in the old days, we had to pick up the phone to talk to real people. Now, like you guys, it's like, if it's not on a text, why would I call somebody, you know? So it's a big leap for, the, for you to go out and talk to folks. But by the end of it, they are talking to everybody about the most intimate parts of their health life, you know? It's like we've had people talk about addiction, about gun violence, about sexual assault. I mean, it's just it's amazing how you get people to open up. And that's a big piece of what journalism is, is just sort of building trust and getting people to tell you their stories. So, so yeah, so the, the half of the students are public health students, and so they're learning the how to tell a story side of it. And they are also really learning and struggling with this advocacy side of their their personality and their passion and their their professional vocation because they feel like they've got the they've got their microphone now and they're going to tell you exactly how how you should think and that's where Anne comes in and uh -huh. finds in the most subtle places advocacy that I wouldn't even notice. <laughs> so we're going to play that next. Yeah. All right. So we have this one student who I adore because we fought every day in class. He came in with his public health opinion that he was going to just tell me that journalism was completely up the wazoo and we're doing it all wrong. And uh, so I convinced him that he needed, to, you know, he was his whole thesis, his whole research is on gun violence and preventing gun violence and you know, guns are evil. Take your guns away. And I convinced him he needed to talk to gun owners. And so he produced this piece. Yeah. And so I guess we, we can also, his first story was about addiction. And they were supposed to be four minute stories. And his was a very willful eight to 10 minutes. And he was very clear that there was nothing he could cut because- Everything was important. Everything was important. And then, um, with this story, he he, he switched we straw directions light. a little bit. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> you can have it. Donna Major, a certified firearms instructor, took me onto a Massachusetts gun range for a one-on-one -on -one crash course in handgun shooting. 
it signifies to me something that I have grown to love and enjoy doing and something that helped me to develop into the person who I like. It is a weapon when you look at it as a weapon, but it's also like a baseball bat or, you know, pool cue or, yeah, it, it's part of my, my sport. Major grew up without any guns in the household. In fact, her only childhood memory of a gun was a rifle that her grandfather used for hunting, one she never shot. Shooting was kind of a midlife crisis for me, and actually he was reading somebody's obituary, and this person sounded fantastic with all the different things that they did, and I said, gee, what would they say am I? I realized that it wouldn't be that interesting, and you know, I was a good wife, I was a good mother, and I liked to garden, and I liked photography, but it all sounded kind of, you know, boring. Another certified firearms instructor, who preferred to remain anonymous, had a similar beginning with firearms. His only childhood connection came from a German pistol that his dad retrieved during World War II. Every year became the ceremonial unveiling of the Luger. You know, he'd bring it out, and my mother was like, don't take that stupid thing out, you know? And, uh, we're Jewish, so it became known as the Juger. <laughs> and he always liked that idea. This instructor didn't purchase his first real firearm until his mid-30s, upon joining a gun club in California. Quickly, however, he grew to love shooting. It's a sport thing. Can you get faster? Can you get more accurate? It feels like mastering an instrument. The learning curve on a violin, I mean, it could be decades. And learning to shoot really well takes years. Tony Leoker, a news photographer with Channel 7 News in Boston, shot his first gun as a child. When I was a young kid, you know, I was with Boy Scouts, and that kind of like started with my interest in shooting. My father was a shooter, an old story man. He was in uh, intelligence, and you know, he was always armed, and there were guns around the house, and there are guns around my house now. Leoker's love of guns has led to quite a collection. Probably had nine different pistols, one revolver, and shotguns, I probably had 12 different ones. And then, I don't know how many rifles I have, I have a few. <laughs> Not that many. I don't have an armor. Although Leoker and the other gun owners share a fascination with guns, opinions diverged surrounding civilian owned assault weapons. Sometimes you have to fight an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You get into the whole issue of being able to rise up against a tyrannical government. Never say never because anything is possible in this world. The second Massachusetts firearms instructor held a very different view. These guys who are in militias, exercising their Second Amendment and are worried about a government takeover, uh, these guys really haven't thought this through. They would be a mosquito bug smear on a windshield if you know the Army Reserves or the Marines came into one of their stupid compounds. I mean, they would be vaporized in a half a second. The whole motley crew of them and their precious AR-15. Regardless of this discrepancy, all parties agreed that for self-defense, using a firearm should only be the last resort. I think growing up in the city, I've never really been a fearful person. So did it make me feel safer? No, it didn't make me feel safer because I didn't feel unsafe. I think it just made me feel that if I needed to protect myself, I was more able to do so. I carry a, a lot, pretty much all the time. I would like to be able to have a gun on just because I don't know who I'm gonna be bumping into. But I hope I never, ever, 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 ever have to use it. And it would probably be a pretty extreme situation for me to even think about pulling it out. I have a full carry license and I don't carry it. I've got no reason. I'm not living in a war zone. If you get into a bad situation and you shoot someone, your life is never going to be the same. Though specific policy changes, such as an assault weapons ban, may remain controversial within the gun community, these gun owners agree that America needs a better way to preserve gun rights while protecting the public from gun violence. This is Zev Braun, reporting for WTVU. So, I think, you know, Zev grew in doing that story. He got, he humanized the enemy, right? He did not want to talk to people with guns. He thought they were all bad people. And I think he found, well, they all have different reasons for coming to the table and, and being who they are. 
And even among gun owners, there's differences of opinion. So I think he just, instead of it being this monolithic block of other, he sort of humanized a couple of individuals and got us to sort of listen to each other, which I think is ultimately what I want all of us to do, is to listen um, to each of, what each other has to say. Is that advocacy? Because I want people to listen and care and, and talk to each other. I think that's, I guess I'll be that advocate. But if we listen, hopefully we find solutions and common ground. So that's my two cents. Anything else you want to add? Um, no, I, I, I don't know. I, I love teaching this class um, and this project. It's definitely one of the things um, that is the most interesting aspect of what I do in the School of Public Health. I think because I am, I'm, you know, a humanities major and you know, and a storyteller and a story reader who sits around with a lot of statisticians all the time, and. Um, Spending all this time working with Anne and working with these students has just made me um, sort of appreciate even more the value of stories and the importance of them to um, our public health mission, our global health mission. So we would love to answer your questions about anything, if you have any or want to argue with us. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask a question, just the composition of the class, are they half journalists and half? Yeah. Oh, okay. And do they collaborate on these stories together? Or do they do the stories individually? For example, is it the group of students who are in the public health program, the ones who've done the research on these various issues, and then they share the issues with the journalism students? I mean, is they, there? They, yeah, they each do their own assignments. But in the, we do listen and read each other's work. Oh, so okay. That so that's where the collaboration right. is. In the, in the edit, editing process, they will give advice to each other about, boy, this is so much jargon, it's really boring. They're typing right. this up. We'll say the journalism student and the public health student will say, you know, this is really thin. You need some facts and figures here. So um, it's in the editing, and, in the, and we listen to the pieces and critique each other's work. So that's. But we, I think we initially thought we were going to do this, and maybe we did the first couple of semesters. Yeah. I don't remember, but. Um, it didn't work out that way. So it's a collaboration on that level. Yeah. Um, and the second question I had was, when the students go abroad to do this, um, you know, story, whatever story it is, are they fully supported by the Pulitzer Center in their BU, travels? BU and pays the Pulitzer Center a fee, and with that we get two or three fellowships, and we get visitor and journalists. Pulitzer funds journalism. They fund independent journalists. So as part of our deal, we can get any independent journalists that they've funded to come to BU for free. So the airfare, the hotel is paid, whatever gratuity. Um, they have to be enrolled at BU under this specific course? Or could yes, yeah. That's, that's uh, the, big, the big lure to get them into our classes, say, you can get a free foreign trip at the end of the semester. So, um, so it, it's, uh, it, it, I, it, 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 a couple of years we've had more money to send more than two students and we wish we could send everybody. And we, actually one year we got a Gates Foundation grant of $100,000 and took 10 students to Kenya and did a whole thing with 10 Kenyan students. Um, and that was kind of more of a very much American-Kenyan partnerships um, where we sent students out together because it was about talking about foreign aid and how it impacts people who are the recipients of foreign aid. Um, so the Kenyan students could get I mean, the American students connected to NGOs that were in there in Western Canada. So. Yeah, but the Pulitzer Center does have something called the Campus Consortium, which we're a member of. And so for, I don't even know how much it is, $10,000 or something like that, universities um, join and then they can um, also send students on fellowships and then get lots of Journalists. And they okay. produce curriculum guides and for and lots of research and lots of it's, it's really a fabulous <coughs> tool for teachers. And if you're looking for a graduate, you know, program with little bells and whistles, uh, look into the Pulitzer Center Campus Consortium because I think it's um, it's a great way to get people out into the field. And you you don't need to be part of the consortium actually to use their teaching tools. So their website is fantastic, and they do have all these. They have curriculum from. K through 12, um, also um, increasingly for undergrads and graduate level, um, specifically on, on health, but they're not only doing health, they're doing all they're sorts of they're, they're, they're um, crisis they're, all over the world. They're doing the, for the whole um, New York Times, slavery 1619 project, 
69. Um, that's they're they're doing all the curriculum for that for schools K through 12. So um, they're very topical. They're they're jumping on stuff. Like that. Any other questions? We're losing our. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, you got some good ideas. Any yeah. other questions? Thank you. Any other comments? No questions. Me? Yes. One. Go right ahead. Just one last one that I I just want to. I guess make the plug that obviously public health is so important right now and so is journalism. Um, I haven't been to many talks about public health, but as far as journalism goes, I think the, one of my favorite uh, quotes that I've heard is uh, Mike Resendez from the Spotlight team of the Boston Globe came and spoke and, and his closing comment to us was, I just want to ask you to remember that it's good journalism that holds powerful people and organizations accountable. Right. And, um, and so that whole quest for an unbiased truth, you know, has, has changed lives and, and, and policy. And it does hold, you know, I do believe that, you know, what else would hold, you know, powerful people and organizations Kind of, somebody has to get the story. So, but thank you both. It was great. Yeah, and we need people in the field of public health and in other fields um, to do the research and have the statistics and the information that then journalists can translate into stories to inform the public. So it's a very, very interesting We're the last frog in the machine. Yeah. Let, let yeah. them do all the hard work and all the research. And but the deal one with. thing that I think we forgot to mention is that people in public health often actively avoid journalists. We don't trust them, and we think they're just going to take up our time and they're going to get it wrong. And I can't tell you how many of my colleagues say things like, I'm never talking to another journalist again. And then I always have to say, no, no, you should, and here's why, and they're not all bad. I, mean, I think a lot of experts think journalists can never bring the expertise to its full, you know, full view. And that's not our job, is to regurgitate your journal article. It is to talk, be the bridge between the journal researcher and the public. And I think that's for a lot of very academic people, they don't understand that there is this, we have to, dumb it down if you want to call it, but we have to synthesize it in a way that your average person can understand it. Right. So. Yeah. All right. Any other comments? We're going to say thank you. <laughs>